there. Welcome to the show. I've got two excellent guests joining me today and the rest of the week. Going to be light posting here on the podcast because I am on the road. Makes it harder to produce the show entirely on my own. But I'm excited to be heading down to Florida or in Florida, I guess, as you listen to this. And Orlando, if you're in or around Orlando, you want to come out and have drinks tonight. That is Wednesday, the 13th of October, 2021. Email me, standupwithpete at gmail.com, and I'll send you the bar hotel I will be at. Looking forward to meeting some folks uh, tonight. Down here for the Florida Education Association annual Gathering, very excited to be speaking and moderating a panel, doing a little comedy. My friend Andrew Spar, the president of the Florida Education Association, the biggest teachers union in Florida. I do whatever he tells me to do. Hopefully I'll get to sit down and interview him. Also, Randy Weingarten is going to be down here. So a lot going on. Very busy. And I still am going to be posting episodes of the podcast interviews every day, probably two like normal every day. But it's just really hard to produce the news segment as well. So I will miss doing it. I hope you'll miss hearing it. I'll get back to it next week. Also, no hangout this week because I'll be on the road and the program is Thursday night when I normally host the hangout. So we'll either catch up on the weekend or next week, but check the patreon.com slash Pete Dominic for that and your email if you're a stand-up member. Okay, so hopefully you're cool with that and you're not mad at me because that would be really upsetting to me. But I'm also, I think, a little under the weather and I have a very early fight. want to make sure I get my rest so I don't get sick. Uh, that tends to happen to me. But as long as I get sleep, I should be good. Ankle's feeling better. I'm feeling better. All is uh, starting to run better for me. And I've got, I'm have got. i really excited to share both my interviews with you with Dave Siegel and comedian and producer Dave Siegel and Wajad Ali coming up right now. Of course, you know Waj. He's a columnist at the Daily Beast, former CNN contributor, MSNBC contributor, New York Times contributor. He is a playwright, and he's got a brand new book out and available for pre-order. Go get it now. Go back to where you came from and other helpful recommendations on how to become American. He is also on Twitter at Wajahad Ali. Let's get it started with him right now. With Wajahat Ali, whose book is available for pre-order, and we can talk about it forever. We can talk about everything and all things, and I'm very happy to see you. Thank you for joining me. And what what is the status of the pre-order? Can I pre-order? You can pre-order the book anywhere where fine books and not-so-fine books are sold. Thank you for reading it. Thank you for promoting it. Uh, it's out January 25th. So uh, right now I'm sitting there signing like 3,000 copies and, and, and wondering who will purchase this. And I'm amazed, man. I'm amazed that anyone buys a book. Like it's a miracle. Like the writing a book and like publishing it and purchasing it is it just, it's like every, everything's a mini miracle to me. Well, this is a great book to buy and to read. And I'm actually kind of excited and interested to see your promotional tour of it because you know everybody, a lot of people in media, and they mostly like you. And so I'm seeing you going to you're going to appear on all kinds. Like, when does that start? I can't wait to 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 see everybody talking about it with you. See, I have no idea, man. You're very kind. I'm that's what someone tells me. But like, you know, how it is in the pandemic. You're sitting at home. You're in your shack. I'm in my I'm I'm in my little office, which uh, is raided by the wildlings. And so, like, we're kind of divorced from the reality of how people perceive us. And like, so you saying that to me, like, gives me some hope because I was just telling my wife yesterday, I'm like, how does any book get sold? Like, how does anyone sell a book? It's remarkable. So I'm hoping that stuff happens in January. I'll reach out to some friends. I'll come on your podcast. I hope people read it. I'm Look, I think I did my job. I was honest. I was authentic. The people who've read it really appreciate it. People who I respect, people like yourself. So, you know, it's it's one of those things where you, you release into the world and you try your best and then you try your best to promote it, and then you just hope word of mouth takes it the rest of the way. That's my hope. I well, hope like some middle-aged uh suburban moms were apparently the market the movers and shakers of books like someone in cincinnati reads it and goes karen and samantha this warbalot ali has written a really insightful book you should read warbalot's book and then they you know start their book club and they invite me on zoom and then you know (laughs) you are waja the hut (laughs) all names that you were called growing up uh, which you get into in, in the book as well and i'm i'm loving it man i i don't know how you make like every other sentence is really legitimately funny 
Like, but you're that you can talk funny. You're just so uh, hilarious throughout talking about your own struggle and, and, and your family and the issues and growing up in America. And so I wanted to just start by asking you today and we can get into, you know, obviously, as we always do some current event stuff. Uh, but but. Articulate what it's like to be as American as me, but you're not seen that way. It's uh, it's interesting because I think Hassan and I said this where he said, like, you're part of the home team, but you're always wearing an away jersey. Uh, And like for me, it's when you go to school in America is when you first realize that you are them and us. That's when you realize, oh, the other kids don't have turmeric stains. And, and they're speaking this language called English that I've heard on television and not everyone's brown. Like that's when you first realize you're quote unquote ethnic and on the margins, you're not the center. And then you have to make a choice. What do I do to get to the center? What do I do to, to you know, get along with the center? Do I compromise? Uh, do I wear a mask? How many masks? What do I compromise? Do I give up my Pakistaniness? Do I give up my Musliminess? Um, you know, do I listen to Taylor Swift and Dixie Chicks? Uh, and well, that's more recent, but for our generation, right? It's the yeah, 1980s. Well, yeah. Yeah, it's like Randy Travis, you know, you know, and you, so this is compromise this entire time of where you have to self police yourself to placate the quote unquote mainstream and the gaze of the main, the eye of Sauron. And it's a really remarkable type of tightrope that you have to walk when you're seen as both us and them, even though, like you said, you're wholly American. When people tell me to go back to where you came from every day, I get these amazing emails like my, my tongue in cheek, smart ass re- response is Fremont, California, the Bay Area. I'd love to if you pay the rent. Like, where am I supposed to go back to? Like Pakistan, like uh, pre partition, post partition, Karachi. <laughs> like, you know, like it's, it's a remarkable state of being when you are seen as a foreigner, but you're also part of the home team. And specifically being Muslim and a person of color after 9 11, when you are a citizen and, and a foreigner, when you are seen or asked to be a, a, a loyal patriot, but you're always seen as a suspect. And you ask yourself, when will this end? And the answer is never. Your loyalty will always be questioned and you will be indicted and convicted and sentenced by a nameless judge or an executioner. And no matter what you do to be liked by the mainstream, it'll never be enough. So that's why you get to a point. And I think I got to that point earlier in my life. Some people never do, Pete, which is a tragedy, where I said, F this, F the game, F the center, F the mainstream, F trying to please the the, the gaze of uh, the gaze of Sauron. I'm just not the gaze of Sauron, the G A Z E. Uh, I'm fine pl- pleasing the gaze <laughs> of Sauron. <laughs> uh, but it's like you know, uh, I'll just be myself. And then like you know, you make the decision. I think you and I have made the decision. We talked about this. We'll play in our corner of the playground, and people want to come play with us. Come on by. Yeah. And I'll stretch and expand the playground for as many kids like me who were told to go back to where you come from. But I'm tired of trying to play to the middle or placate the quote unquote moderate uh, undecided voters of the Rust Belt named Chet and Travis who drink coffee. Yeah, there is definitely a shift for uh, for a lot of ethnic minorities in the country of a certain generation that seems to sound similar. Like, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. I'm not going to explain it to you. I'm not going to play with you. If you have a question, I'm happy to answer it. If you want to play with me, I'm happy to play with you. But I'm, I'm not going to we're not doing this anymore with you. We're not inferior and we're not going to act as if we are something like that. Yeah, man, because it's been exa- I've done that game. I've yeah, played yeah. every variation of this game for the betterment of not only America, but also our communities. If you expect me to be nice, I'll be nice. If you expect me to be the educator, I'll educate. If you expect me to be your Google entry because you can't Google. Fine. If you expect me to be the guy who does the book summary, no problem. If you expect me to be the Wikipedia entry, sure. If you expect me to be the fireman that rushes in and, and, and douses out the fire, no problem. But every relationship, you know, I think any healthy relationship requires reciprocity. And I think what you're witnessing right now is a lot of people of color are like, yo, we're here. We've always been here. But we need a hand that reaches out across the middle. In fact, we need you to cross the street to show that you're serious. Like, what work have you done lately? And if you haven't done the work, you're not a serious person. I can't take you seriously. And I'm just tired. And I'm going to move on. And that's how, that's the way I feel about the majority in this country. Not just people of color, but specifically, you know, parallel conversation, vaccines. Like, I'm like, yo, if you if you don't want to do this, if you're exhausted by this, if you're rolling your eyes, if you want to do your research like Kyrie Earth and figure out whether or not we're on flat Earth or round Earth, you go ahead. But the caravan that, that houses the majority is going to move forward. But what I will say is this. And I think you and I have talked about this. We have to have a generous spirit. 
the door to the caravan's always open. Yeah. But it's up to you to meet us. But we got to move forward. Yeah. Because I can't have the conversation that I've had in 2001. Where are the moderate Muslims? And how come you haven't condemned extremism? And tell us what you're doing to help national security. Yo, that's that's 2002. And we're in 2021 going to 2022. And my kids are not going to inherit that narrative. It's not going to happen. They're, it's already too late for them. So you mentioned uh, Kyrie Irving. Is that his name? That is that is the name of this basketball player. You're a big uh, a basketball fan. And about a certain time of, of day, at a certain time of year, your Twitter feed becomes unreadable for me because you're just tweeting about basketball. It started about two weeks, sir. Yeah. When is it starting? Should I mute? Is there a way to mute you at a certain yeah, time? I tell everyone you mute me at night starting October okay. when there's Warrior Games. And you mute me on Sundays during football. And right now, if you're a Dodgers fan, you have to mute me because if San Francisco wins, I'm going to be so obnoxious. You're a baseball I, fan, too? or a, just I'm, a, I'm a Bay Area sports fan, right, and okay. I'm very obnoxious, and I'm an exquisite troll, and I'm absolutely merciless when it comes to my team's right. beating L.A. Okay, yeah, I don't care about any of that. So, uh, But I do care because you're, you are a basketball fan, and this is an important cultural issue right now with, with what's happening. You know, a lot of people are comparing the NBA to the NFL when it comes to COVID and race and stuff. But 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 this is more about COVID and vaccination. So the the Brooklyn Nets, is it? Well he's, done, sir. Well done. You're still a man. He's <laughs> he's one of the star players of the team and, and of the league, I guess. And he refused to get vaccinated and has some real wacky out there thoughts, apparently. And the Nets today said, well, you're not allowed to play in New York because New York City has these regulations. But you know what? You're not allowed to play at all until you get vaccinated, which is a massive move because he's a key player. And if money Huge. matters, winning is the only thing. And so I feel like this is actually a really important touchstone uh, uh, point right now that the NBA is. I mean, is there is there any, talk to me about the Brooklyn Nets move and, and why it matters and what you think about it? Yeah, so it's a remarkable power move by the Brooklyn Nets, and which was, you better believe, co-signed by his superstar teammates, Kevin Durant and James Harden, who also play the basketball, Pete, and are some of the best players. <laughs> right, and they right. make up this triumvirate, right, with Kyrie Irving, that they're, they're expected to win the championship. So like you said, the fact that the Brooklyn Nets came out and said this means that the buy-in of the coach, uh, Steve Nash, and they have the buy-in of Kevin Durant and James Harden, who are pretty much saying, yo, we're willing to compromise our season and our championship hopes and dreams over this stance, because we cannot allow Kyrie Irving to pretty much say, yeah, I'm only going to practice and play in the home games and not the away games, or excuse me, the away games, not the home games. And what you're seeing is an attempt by the NBA. And I think private sector and public sector, you're seeing this now more and more, especially before the busiest travel season in America, enough is enough. The majority is sick and tired of the unvaccinated minority hijacking us and our children and our elders and the immunosuppressed like my daughter and our school boards. And you're seeing them say, okay, the same example I said, the caravan is moving forward. That's what Brooklyn Nets said. You figure out what you want, Kyrie Irving. You have the freedom not to get vaccinated. You have the freedom to believe that, you know, uh, scientists have created this to control black men. Uh, if, you know, and you have this freedom to, to walk off the flat earth into oblivion. But the rest of us are moving forward. And Kyrie, like you said, and even you, a man with limited sports knowledge, knows this. He's a superstar. He's part of the players union. So the fact they went against Kyrie, that's like your zero tolerance policy right there. Like enough's enough. And they're throwing the gauntlet down, which is huge. I'm all for it. I'm all for it. What are the consequences? What's the react? I mean, le I care less about the social media reaction to some extent. But what, what are the what are the consequences? What do you think the, the larger uh, cultural or consequences or for just you know pro sports much less amateur sports for, uh, on this issue it gives you strength to move forward it, it shows you the brooklyn nets are willing to part with Kyrie irving uh literally willing to move on their, to their season without a superstar and it shows you that there's zero tolerance for even the biggest stars so it means if you want to get paid you better get vaccinated and if not it's done furthermore what i'm afraid of and i hope i'm wrong about this is we're probably going to get a vaccine for kids in about three weeks to four weeks right under 12. My fear, and, and again, I hope I'm wrong about this, is that the right wing, which is further radicalizing and weaponizing, is going to weaponize around this occurrence. And there is going to be spasms of violence. We've already seen threats against uh, school boards. We've already seen threats against uh, healthcare workers. We're already seeing people quit school boards. We're already seeing supervisors beg Joe Biden 
for security. Remember, that's like a big piece of news that came out two weeks ago. So what happens when you have the NBA stepping up, NFL, United Airlines, Delta, Amtrak, you know, government employees, contractors, the army, schools, Pete, has always been the cultural flashpoint in America, even leading up to, you know, going back to segregation. And these people very deliberately are weaponizing LGBTQ, CRT, vaccines around schools. Yeah. yeah. So the next step is going to be school mandates, like in California. And that's where I'm, I'm really, that's where the rubber is going to hit the road, man. I, that's where, like, if we can push past that, I think you're going to see come January, a majority of this country vaccinated and we'll be able to flatten it. But we're going to have to deal with this radicalized minority. That's my fear. I hope I'm wrong. Maybe you think I'm wrong. I actually don't think you're wrong. And sometimes I do, but you're, you're, you're almost always right. You and, uh, uh, Jared Yates Sexton on, on these on a lot of these issues, your predictions have unfortunately, you know, come true. But I mean, I think part of the problem is the the reporting on this and obviously a lot of other things in terms of mandates. Do they work? Do they not work? You can choose to report a story on how they work in this city, this organization, the military, United Airlines, this school. You can choose that headline. And and if the headline says thousands uh, of, of military members will not get vaccinated then that's the wrong headline if there's a million <laughs> members. No, just, well, you, you, your excellent example. Let's just go back last week where the headlines were 650 United employees choose not to get vaccinated and will get fired, which that name number later changed to 350 because 300 did. The story should have been 99.5% of United employees comply with the vaccine mandate. And so there's also a failure of the media here. And you want to talk about current affairs. You know, look at this poll that just came out. CBS poll that shows that once you break down what's in Biden's Build Back Better plan, which is a hilarious title, the English major appreciates the alliteration for Biden's Build Back Better plan. Once they break down, like the the friggin' popularity for this is 75, 80%, 69%, right? But if the media fails to do its job to report on it and keeps doing these jobs about like, you know, these media hit jobs and Biden's failing, and if Democrats, let's fault it, I'm gonna write about this tonight. The Democrats have a popular agenda, but if you don't message on that agenda and people don't know what's in your agenda, who's to blame? Right. So I feel like it's a double yeah, problem yeah, where the Democrats yeah. got a message on this and the media has to do a better job with framing, in my opinion. I mean, let's talk about that, because I think, you know, I, I'm trying to get I'm reaching out to the, the I'm talking with folks at the Biden administration, trying to get either administration folks on the show or just policy experts, because. This bill has not been sold well, and we can blame whoever we want. But the bottom line is people really don't know what's in it. And when they do know what's in it, uh, it's overwhelmingly popular. I think you were tweeting about that. Did you just say you're writing something about that? Yeah, I'm going to write about that tonight is that, the you know, Democrats have the right agenda, but they have terrible messaging and only they're to blame. Like, look, there is a a, a report that came out in Politico, I think yesterday, talking about Democratic frustration over the child tax credit. Like we got 700 bucks. I was sitting there a couple of weeks ago. $700 $700 appeared in my bank account. I'm like, what happened? I looked at the news. I'm like, holy crap, child tax credit. This is amazing. It was it was amazing, right? We, like we used it on the kids. Uh, we went out, got food. I got them a Lego set, paid off some bills. Most people don't even uh, give the Biden administration credit for it. They don't even think he's responsible. If you don't share and celebrate this news, how will people know? Meanwhile, you have a slow moving coup happening right in front of our face where the GOP is literally radicalizing preparing for 2022, 2024, you got these big wins. And like you said, the poll shows that once you break down what's in the Build Back Better plan, people are like, holy crap, subsidies for childcare? Yes, please. Uh, some money for college education? Yes, please. Affordable health care? Yes, please. Medicare, you know, negotiating with pharma? Yes, please. Like, it's a win. But if you don't sit there and message, if Joe Biden doesn't go on Stephen Colbert, if Kamala Harris doesn't go on The View, if you don't have, like, nice TikTok, you know, messages, who do you blame, Pete? Yeah. It's a really frustrating, man. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's uh, it's a really good it's a really good point. I mean, I think Nancy Pelosi today said you guys you guys haven't sold this very well, which is a dumb thing word to say sold. It's not journalist job to sell politicians agenda, no matter how great it is. Uh, and, you know, we can talk about political coverage of such things. But it's true that I think it's fair to argue that in the media zeitgeist, there hasn't been nearly enough talk about this. Also, just to be critical of 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 the Biden administration for a second, like Biden himself has not been out there selling Absolutely. this nearly enough the way Obama and, and Trump and almost every other politician does their agenda. And 
I'm sure there's a reason why he hasn't. Maybe they don't think he's great at it. Maybe they think surrogates are better at it or something. But I feel like nobody has been to And where is Barack Obama? I think he'd go out there and, and make some speeches about it, too. But I think that's what they're ramping up to do. The administration. Like, so. what, what I'm saying, I agree with you, man. I, like, I, the whole time I was like, listen, Biden has his gaffes. He'll say some stupid stuff. People know this. 81 million people voted for him. Right. He's like your grandfather that you invite to the barbecue who like you can trust around the kitchen. He'll flip the, like the hot dog and he'll ramble on and tell a story of, like five minutes too long. And he might say something offensive, but you realize it's just grandpa. But then like the kids love him and he'll, you know, give him some cookies. All right. Let him just do that. Like, let him just go there like in his folksy weird way. You're the president, man. Sell your agenda. You're the president. And I want him to do this. But they're trying to protect him and cocoon him, right, because of the of the gaffes he does. I don't think America cares, bro. We just survived Donald Trump, who, like, has verbal diarrhea and says, like, the most insane batshit stuff. Uh, and people love him. I think people will be fine with Biden. My concern also here is with we're finally coming to this, this, this tipping point. And it's going to be interesting where I think the Democratic Party is realizing that the moderates are in the minority and the progressives are the majority. And you have to have the Democratic Party, again, with messaging, own the term progressive. You can't run away from it anymore. These centrists and moderates cannot run away from the term progressive. Own it, define it. What does it mean? Sell it to the American people. Because in the absence of that, you have people like Ted Cruz and Hawley and others defining progressives as socialism and communism. And it sticks. It works. And so if like, you've never seen a Republican shy away from the term conservative. Why do Democrats shy away from progressive? Question for you, Pete Dominic. Uh, I think it's branding. I think it's polling. I think it's focus grouping. What the, all those words and 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 how they land with people. But I, I mean, progressive can't be. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. But I think I think it's it. They 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 think too much about it. I mean, Bernie Sanders has always been a great salesman at his ideas. What he does is he repeats the same shit over and over and over and over again, and it That's works. Right. And and he's not really using labels that much. He's talking about policy, which is why I've always liked him. Which is why, by the way, I like like Ron Paul. I mean, I hated Ron Paul, but he was talking about policy a lot and 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 that's why people didn't you know often pay attention but anyway i should never compare him the uh two more quick questions for you one is um would you would you have a threesome with superman because i definitely would like i would have sex i would have sex with a a fictional superhero character or a real one i think uh, I, uh, you know, I'm very antiquated in my, in my old school ways. Unfortunately, I'm not mm -hmm. adventurous, but for uh, the story watch, come on. I mean, like, I, I mean, the thing is I like, I have a one penis policy per bedroom and I, I just want that to be my penis. And I realize this makes yeah. me like, in you know, uh, I, I get it for the kids listening. I, I, I understand. I, I am a very boring heterosexual man here. Okay. Let's uh, say Catwoman and Superman and you. I, you know, like the swords will cross and I'm like a 40 year old Daisy man. And like, I'll always be nervous. And then you see Superman, like, like Adonis and like, you know, he can like, you know, impregnate everyone. And then I'll just like, I won't even get an erection. I'm like, this is just, I can't compete with this. Oh, that would be, that would be, that would, then don't do it. Cause that would be the worst story of like, I couldn't even get but, hard. But you know what I would do? I couldn't even get hard happen, for I'll, Superman. I'll myself, I'd be like getting towels for super, Superman and make chai. I give like Gatorade. I'm like, do you need to be hydrated, Catwoman? You see me like you're a little thirsty. I'll make sandwiches. I'll make PB and J. Like that'll be my job. Like I'll realize how useless I am in the first 30 seconds of this threesome, and then I'll just end up like, you know, I'll like blog it. I'll, I'll, I'll like the Catwoman be like, just live tweet this. You're just so used. Just live tweet it. And I'm like, I live tweet it. Yes, that is awesome. But you know what though? I will say, I just tweeted about the because Dean Kane is trending for all the wrong reasons. As usual. <laughs> uh, Dean Cain was, for those who don't know, played uh, Clark Kent in the 1994 Lois and Clark Adventures. And he's trending because he now is pissed off about, you know, Clark Kent's son being bisexual. And I just want to remind people, these are fictional characters. They are not real. And I'm really disturbed by how no one is like upset that an alien is having sex with a woman. Like this is, you know, like, why is it, why is it okay for a Kryptonian to come impregnate our human women that you know, people aren't afraid of that, but like Clark Kunt's fictional son is gay and like bisexual, sorry. And everyone's freaking out. But I will say this. I think you said Clark Kunt just now. I think yeah, I, heard I, said, you. No, I said Clark Kent. I, I, uh, I may have, you may have misspoke. It might, you know, it's Freudian slip. Um, <laughs> what I will say is this though, to show you how, uh, what a, what a renegade and rebel I am. Terry Hatcher, bro. If 1995 Terry yeah. Hatcher approached me like yeah. now yeah. and said like you and me right now, 10 minutes. Yeah. After, 
For well, 10 yeah. seconds, I would be tempted. Gorgeous. And I think my yes. wife would allow that temptation for 10 so seconds. So many women have played and men have played those roles of, of Clark and Lois. And, and I could probably have a conversation about who my who my favorites are, who I think the sex Terry is. Hatcher, bro. Terry Hatcher, by far my favorite. Lois. Yeah. Lois. Although I like the new Lois on the new the new uh, whatever. Well, she's really good. Series. But you have to realize for those who are listening, like Terry Hatcher came into our lives. Yeah. She was like this, like God, like manna from heaven. We were like 15 year old kids. Yeah. The internet had just started. It was yep. her first. Remember the first viral photo was her draped in the, the cape. It's a very special thing. So I know I, but... I would watch Lois and Clark just for Lois. It's the only time I would not care about Superman at all. Uh, final question I wanted to ask you is about January 6th and everything surrounding it and the commission investigating it and where we are at. Because there's some new reporting about it. Of course, the Senate right. has a report, but the House still doing their investigation, the subpoenas of Bannon. There's news about Mark Meadows uh, today. You know, where, where are we at and where are we going? Are you satisfied? I'm absolutely not satisfied, but I am satisfied, satisfied that we can go from Terry Hatcher to uh, right. the slow moving That's what we do here. A we do. minority rule that is going to happen in this country. Look, the reality is we are this. This is, this is what we're seeing. If you ever see the Bond movie and I saw the latest one, it's good. Usually Bond's villain reveals his dastardly plan in the last act. We are seeing the Bond villain literally give you a memo telling you about his plan in the first 10 minutes. And he's admitting it. He's on social media. He's going on TV. We know literally what the Republicans are going to do to derail democracy and to put in loyalists to achieve minority rule for white Christian supremacy. We know it. Uh, anything that gave you any sort of delusion that they're going to moderate after the January 6th insurrection or the election should have been obliterated by Trump's rally, uh, by Mark Meadows appearing on Fox News, by Stephen Scalise refusing to say that Biden won the election, by them doing the fraudits even after the audit that they did in Arizona went against them, uh, by the purging of Liz Cheney, by the purging of Republican secretaries of state, by the voter suppression bill, right? And by all the evidence, like you mentioned, that showed that Donald Trump pressured the Justice Department and literally everyone around him uh, to do a coup. But thankfully, there were a few Republicans who decided to put country above party. So with that being said, we have a year left to save our democracy. And Steve Bannon and Meadows and Scavino have pretty much given a middle finger to the subpoenas. Right. And so why doesn't the majority enforce the subpoenas and hold these people in contempt? And why isn't Merrick Garland putting the pedal to the metal and flexing not being partisan, literally looking at the evidence that we all have seen in front of us and enforcing it and then doing some indictments. Because in the absence of people literally going to jail for this and having consequences for trying to do a coup, which was barely unsuccessful, but will be successful in 2022, we are going to see the end of democracy, Pete. That's why. So, I mean, I hate terrifying people, but you said me and Jared have been right. We've been yeah, worrying no, about this for yeah. years. And now you got Bill Maher on our side. You got Robert Kagan, a white conservative man, saying everything we've been saying. This country loves listening to white conservative men. Don't listen to us. Listen to Kagan. Listen to Bill Maher. Yep. 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 All good points. Uh, I'll let you go. I love talking to you. I really appreciate your time, everybody. Uh, you can pre-order the book now. Go back to where you came from and other helpful recommendations on how to become an American. And and uh, we will do a full, robust interview on it whenever you want. But uh, there's going to be a major, major media blitz, major media think blitz. So? Oh, I, I, I think people do... like this book. What do you think? I haven't talked to you about it. I will. They, yeah. you, you know, th what's funny is you made the point. Like I interview authors all the time. So I'm reading their books, but you know, I've also talked with smart people about our people reading books, right? It's a, it's an issue of we're not reading long enough articles, much less books. For all people who love books and context and an interesting subject matter, if you like nonfiction, you know, and, and this book is a memoir and it's hilarious and it's uh, your point of view and it's amazing. So I, I think that if anybody that li likes reading books, nonfiction especially, they're going to love this for sure. For sure. No, that means a lot, man. I'm glad you like it. It's so that funny. It's annoyingly funny. <laughs> like I'm I laughing to... out loud all the time. And I, I, I it's hard for me because I keep thinking, could I ever write something with this many laughs, authentic, real laughs in it? And I struggle with the answer. You um, are you are a stand up comedian. Uh, I envy stand up comedians. Uh, I don't know if I admitted this to you back in the day when I was in high school. Uh, my dream was either to uh, what well, people told me either to go into film and be a director 
or be a stand-up comedian. So I have respect for stand-up comedians. Yeah, no, I'm glad do. you didn't. It's not a great life. I'm glad you chose <laughs> yeah. the life that you... you oh, I married a doctor, so that, that, a, I get to eat. There's a lot of ways to use humor, and you've used it in your personal life, uh, your marriage, and in this book, and in your commentary always. So it, it's always all there. And so you've applied that skill very well, sir. Thank no, you. man, thank you. Glad I appreciate you, always thank talking you. to you. Thanks for having me on. And uh, anytime we could talk about childhood adolescent crushes, I'm here for it. You know, I've, I've, we've done that before where I told you I interviewed like a lot of mine, right? Yeah, I, mean, I said you hit the jackpot. Yeah, yeah, you, that's you, right. I just want to just hit you. And, and the fact that you didn't come off as a creeper is, is a remarkable testament to you. A couple being of them a, gave me their phone number, like not for, you know, like uh, I told you, Win- Winnie Cooper, uh, Danica McKellar. Oh, Winnie, yeah. Like she gave me her phone number. She's like, if your daughters ever need help with math, because I, t- to be fair, I told her my daughter was struggling or whatever, but it, she wasn't. I was just bullshitting her. But I would never call like call her for that. But uh, but a, but I would never call. But yeah, I felt pretty like a pretty big deal that I have their digits. I mean, isn't it amazing that you can say I have Winnie Cooper's phone number yes. and I can, re- yes, I can rely is. on her for math skills because she's a brilliant uh, mathematician. And I don't even want to tell you the others who gave me their numbers. We got to do this uh, off record. But they uh, rhyme with Sh- Melissa Milan. No, she didn't give me her number. She did not. She Mal- did not. Militia Milano did not give you she her phone not. number. She did not give me her number. You, she surprised. gave me a number, but I'll tell you what, didn't work. Didn't bring me. It, it was br- her assistant. It no, was it Militia brought- Milano's assistant. So, so, she played a really good prank on me. She gave me her number and I called and it was Kirk Cameron. And <laughs> I was like, what? I don't want to. He goes, have you found Jesus yet? You're like, what? Is your Superman gay or straight? Like, I love growing pains. He did. I was like, I think this is the wrong number. And he kept grilling me on such litmus test questions. It was really annoying. If you want growing pains, there'll be a lot of pain and hellfire. You're You're, like, oh, my God. One of the characters in your show is called Boner, dude. I mean, come on. You must have had some input. Uh, Oh, thank you. Last thing I'll say is we were just saying uh, a bunch of friends and I were just talking about, isn't it sad? Like so many of these. You know, these childhood icons we grew up with, like, drifted to right-wing nuts, yeah, like Dean S- Kane and Kevin Sorbo and Kurt Scott Cameron. Bayo. Yeah, my man, it's just painful. Like, yeah. that's that's why Hollywood needs to, look, Hollywood needs to subsidize and take care of its childhood actors or else they turn out like Scott Bayo. Uh, um, another one is uh, Ricky Schroeder. Oh, painful, man. He, yeah. he you know the, why that's so painful is he gave money to bail out Kyle Rittenhouse, yeah. who killed two people. It's yeah. like, come on, Ricky. Yeah. I interviewed him uh, and he seemed off for sure. And, and like he had not NYPD blue too. So like, yeah, yo, no, you he's life good, after silver spoons. Great actor. But let's be clear. Most of them have, have come out right. I mean, listen, Henry Winkler is the nicest guy in the world. I've heard. I've heard he's a great guy. Ron Howard apparently is a really good guy great, too. Great, great guy. Yep. Yep. All right, man. Thank I you very much. You. I love you, buddy. I really appreciate it. Later, buddy. There you go. Wajad Ali, everybody. How about it, huh? Give him a tweet. Tell him you appreciate him joining me here on the show and support all of his work. Get his book. Oh, hey, I forgot to tell you this at the top. Good news. The uh, the Last Week Tonight show has called me back for three more episodes. So that's really good. Maybe I'll get the gig, the regular gig there opening for John Oliver. That would be that would be great for me and my family. So rooting for that. Very excited about that. Can't talk about it much more than that, but I'm excited. It's a great, great show. Award-winning show. I uh, would be very excited to be a regular part of it. So that's good news. Good day yesterday. And now here I am in Orlando, Florida. And I have another guest who now is living down here in Florida. We caught up a couple of days ago. He is a producer of television news as well as a hilarious stand-up comedian and writer. You can find him on Twitter at Stand Up Dave. Also, he'll be performing in Boca Raton, Florida with Kurt Metzger on October 22nd with our great friend Christian Finnegan on November 26th. Comedy on the Green in Boca Raton. Ladies and gentlemen, the always interesting, smart, and funny Dave Siegel at Stand Up Dave joins me right now. There he is, Dave Siegel. He's in Boca Raton. Raton. I don't know I what it's on. I get corrected all the time. I, I don't know. Why are you? I, I understand the Jewish part, but you're not you're, you're not old. So are you just getting is this the minor leagues? Are you prepping? You've been there for a year. Why are you in, in Boca? It's the law that if you're Jewish and from New York, you eventually have to move to Boca. I understand that. But are you doing like an, a year internship and early? Is it what's happening? Why now? Based, I'm the hottest commodity in Boca right now. Like, <laughs> do you understand? Like, I get, I get who my competition okay, is here? I see. I see. Yeah. You're just taking advantage of an early. Are you staying there? Is this temporary? 
So we moved. Yeah, it, the, the timing was crazy. Uh, I closed on my house on, here on March 1st, 2020. You bought a home and, in Florida. Yeah. Ten days later was like the national shutdown. So um, after we had our second kid, we wanted to move, leave the city. And my show on a and had just been canceled, the show that I was producing at the time. So we, it was kind of just like a now or never type thing. And we always liked it down here. And we kind of just pulled the trigger because I was like facing unemployment. In retrospect, luckily, that didn't happen. Like I just landed another producing job, as you know, on uh, News Nation. But yeah, we made the move. But but uh, let me understand, like, in how personally can you get here? And you say you, you get laid off from let go. That show get canceled. Before that, I, you worked at. I, I heard it was getting going to get canceled. Yes. Before that, you had worked at CNN for several years. You've yeah. done a lot of stuff in television, writing and performing and producing. You're really good at it. But so, so was that your thing? Was it like I can live anywhere? Like, weren't you worried about you're leaving New York and you're moving to Florida? The television industry, like, weren't you worried about? Were you worried about what your career was going to do? I was, I was more worried about like the stand up, to be honest with you, because I well, went yeah, from of course that. moving like living ac- uh, around the corner from like one of my favorite venues to like, well, now what am I going to do? But it was more like family oriented. Like our, our second daughter had just been born mm-hmm. and it was like, we, we have to leave the city that we know. Yeah, and so same, we went through the same to, thing. Like, yeah. It came down to Metro New York or South Florida. And we would just like, we looked everywhere and like, what could we afford? what kind of lifestyle are we going to have for our kids? And it was just pros and cons. That's all. We pulled the trigger. So you have family. I mean, that's what it's really, it it ends up often being about that for people. When you have kids, you will sometimes say, you know, if you're close to your family, especially I'll have, I'll have help. I'll have help because my family, how much, so that was a consideration. You, your wife, both of you family. Definitely a factor. Yeah. I mean, we've never really had that. We didn't have anyone in the city. Right. So yeah. I mean, we have a lot of options here. I have a brother here. I have my parents here. Her parents are pretty close. What do you like about Florida? I'm less than two miles from the ocean. That's pretty sweet. I mean, I'll, I'll hop on my bike at like dusk, ride to the ocean, jump in, ride back for like 20 minutes. And it's like, that's, that's kind of a nice lifestyle. You know, the, the water is warm 365 days a year here. You know, I could take my kids to the beach, let them run around on a whim. That, that's really nice. It's a lot of, I, 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 I play pickleball with senior citizens on the weekend. <laughs> Do you try to beat them? <laughs> oh yeah. Do you you try to take advantage of their lack of torque. To their, you know, they, <laughs> they you can't, t- they're, they're, they're pretty good if you hit it right at them. But if you get those legs moving, <laughs> Do you talk garbage? Do you talk trash to the? No, but it's funny because do you, have you ever seen or played pickleball? Yeah, I played. I played with a listener, uh, Joe Joe Leota. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's it's, aw- it's an awesome game. Yeah, it's a great. Like, so my favorite shot is the lob. It's really hard to execute a lob. It's not like tennis because it's a short court. You got to lob like over a five two senior citizen that they can't reach, and just to make them like turn around and try and like hustle back to get in they never do shuffle they get so mad and then they just see me smiling as a as a comic and a, clearly an asshole here uh-huh. uh d- don't you want you have a lot of witty retorts like I, it's so easy to make fun of the elderly which we will we are you know getting closer to be to being ourselves d- you don't you hold back <laughs> come on gramps that laugh that you just executed that's what i do yeah. it's almost yeah. like yeah. watching them like stumble and bumble i'm just like <laughs> The pickleball, the pickleball culture is super fascinating. I wonder if anybody's done like a, like a doc, like a 2020 on it. It's, it's really, how would you explain the type of people, the age, the, the culture, the, the kind of the competition, the, I don't know what else yeah. comes with it. I mean, d- does politics get put aside? The personal things get put aside or, you know, how, how, talk to us about pickleball culture. It's funny you ask because it's really fascinating. First of all, I think it's the only sport where, it's not gender specific. It's not age specific. Right, like anyone right. is playing. And it's almost like a pickup basketball culture where you're just waiting for next, right? You get on with your team, you play, you get off. And it's really rapid fire in that regard. Um, but it's like, a, you know, you're playing on a giant ping pong table with you know, like that you're standing on almost. It's like it combines tennis, racquetball, ping pong, but I think the culture of pickup basketball with elderly people, which is yeah. crazy. There's always an argument. Like I don't partake in that, but they're arguing about rules, about etiquette. It's it's hilarious. Etic- etiquette? 
Oh, there's definitely pickleball etiquette. What is an example? Well, like, like some new, I play the same court every day that I play, but like somebody new will come along, win a match and be like, all right, who's next? And you have to be like, no, 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 no. Both teams get off. It's not winner stays on. And they'll be like, what? No, bullshit. I won. I'm not waiting for 20 minutes. And you have to like, look, there's, if you want, really want to check, there's a board with the rules. That's it, number six says both teams get off. It, it's, it's, it's tyranny. So yeah. This is tyranny. I want my freedom. Don't tell me what to do. Listen, uh, these are the pickleball rules. No, no, you yeah. do, don't. Yeah, there'll, there'll be other courts where, you know, there's four courts. You can make one court winner stays on, which makes sense. But like, you're not getting these people to change the rules after. The, like, only, been- the only other thing I, I feel like it's a very white ish and certain ageist thing but i don't know maybe there's like hispanic and black and asian people playing pickleball all over and i just live in a white community. if they are i leave so i wouldn't, I wouldn't know. <laughs> because you don't want to lose because the humiliation of losing to a minority to you i only play kosher pickleball <laughs> are you is it a it is a jewish community boca right what does that mean i've always heard that because it's the easy but is it a diverse ethnically community it is it's actually like the biggest misconception I had was how diverse it is right now. If you draw a two mile radius, like a circle around my house, I have $10 million mansions on the intercoastal and I have a trailer park within two miles of my house. So it's pretty diverse, uh, socioeconomically, racially. Yeah. What, what? But Florida is such a fucked up state. Like, do you not agree with that? Do you recognize yeah, yeah. it and deal with it? And it's like, whatever, the beach, dusk. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Dusk. I don't we know. I just here. <laughs> I love that you said you go there at dusk, and I didn't. I didn't ping you <laughs> yeah, earlier for it. To it. Uh, <laughs> it is fucked up. The, the governor. You know, I'm not going to get into him. I have strong opinions, but um, it's messed up in a way where I've never lived in a place where it's so split fifty fifty as to politically, like who you're talking yeah, to. Yeah, that's for sure about Florida. Yeah. You know, coming from, I've lived in DC, I've lived in New York and I lived in LA. So, you know, you're pretty safe with a certain political standpoint. So, in so because of that, because of that, because you have the opportunity to see that a lot, I have, I don't know. I've been pretty sheltered in terms of with my, my people and, and, and like-minded people, but Getting out and, and talking to people. I was talking to a guy the other night at the restaurant. My daughter is a hostess at and he's the owner. And he was he's like, you know me, I think I'm some conservative on some things. I'm liberal on some things. And I was like, can we be done with that? Can we just be done with that? And can we say which America or reality, which reality, what earth are you on? I live on the earth where COVID is real. Vaccines work. And Donald Trump lost the election and Joe Biden won the election like do we agree on those and then we can disagree on everything else or is that a dumb threshold or is that something that you think even applies is there any gray area left to see i I would agree with you and i think we're in the minority unfortunately where it's very easy to say (laughs) you have to respect other people's opinions but like certain opinions you can't respect and i think it's it's not an opinion but but that's not an opinion like i'm talking i'm not talking about I'm not talking about opinions. I'm talking about reality. Like it's not my opinion that Joe Biden won or that COVID is real or that vaccines work. Like there's, it's not my opinion. And so I don't, I'm happy to argue opinions, but realities. Okay. But so let's blur it, blur the line even more. Someone can say that, Hey, I believe that, um, you know, Donald Trump is good for this country. He's taken it in the right direction. And that's an opinion. Yeah, sure. Right? Well, yeah, for sure. So you can debate that one. Yeah. Uh, but as long you know, as like, we, <laughs> yeah, but you know, I do try to get a threshold with whoever I'm talking to about what their thinking is at this point. And I'm like, all right, I'm sorry. I have to do this, but let's start with moon made of cheese or not, you know, like Democrats eat babies or not. And then if they're, if they fail the first few, then it's like, well, I don't really care about what you think about anything else. Sorry. Well, and well, now they're making like the January 6th insurrection a political thing. Like they're 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 trying to morph right. that into an opinion. Like, well, you should respect that, you know, I don't think these people are so bad. They're patriots. They're doing, you know, what they thought was right. They're they're making this political by uh, you know, dropping the book on them and giving them these like and like I can't handle that. Like I don't think that's a I don't think that's an opinion. I think these are 
The only thing I would the only thing I would say about that is the people that showed up the Capitol and committed the crimes. And then millions and millions of more were told by not Alex Jones or Sean Hannity, the president of the United States, every single day that the election was rigged. And I mean, they did they overwhelmingly believe and trust him. And more than that, they are cult like they they're cultish about him. And so they're is, almost like being naive or gullible. That's not a defense for a criminal behavior. It never has been. No doubt about it. I'm, 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 I'm not certainly arguing that it, that it should be. But I will argue also, you know, about all kinds of criminals. I always want to get to why someone, you know, why would someone murder a person, uh, assault a child, rape someone? There's I, I mean, maybe some people don't like to talk about it. I do like to talk about why what people's motivations are, what they're thinking is in the in the insurrection. Those people and they still believe it. I mean, that's the problem. The, yeah. Donald Trump is still out there saying things and. What did he say yesterday? He said yesterday something. I don't pay too much attention, but sometimes it breaks through. The Haitian people that have that are, you know on the border, they're he said something like they probably have AIDS. <laughs> he said that, which is like not a like I don't care if they have AIDS. It's also very like let them in. Like, we can treat it. So he's you know he's always been like he's wanted to be a list Hollywood. He's never wanted to be a list politics right and i love how he was just resorts back to like the 80s when he was at his peak in pop culture yeah 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 like, yeah you know and that's when like aids was the big you know scary monster yeah. so that's what's all based on right yeah <laughs> next he was like you know these people are like freddy krueger it's like what you gotta stop with these like 1987 <laughs> references but like that was his peak that's you know? a good point yeah that's a really good point it's 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 so uh, you know, in you're down there in Florida now, I mean, and you're doing comedy in Florida now is that yeah. same divisiveness cutting through with your comedy? Because I'm I'm not looking forward to getting back out to general audiences that don't necessarily know me, which I'm happy to perform in front of and doing a certain type of material that I want to do, which is like making fun of people who believe in conspiracy theories. I want to do those bits, but ha- maybe half my audience or a third or even a few. And if there's a few <laughs> nuts in there, then here we go. There goes the comedy. I got to deal with this guy, this flat earther over here. So let me give you an example of a bit that I did back to back Manhattan, Palm Beach, miles from mar lago Okay. I'll just tell you right off the bat, it went perfectly fine in New York. And then I'll tell you what the gist of the bit was and tell you how it went in Palm Beach. A lot of comedians, you know, with PC culture and stuff like that, they, they don't even use the R word anymore to describe someone who's, you know, maybe mentally limited in some sort of way. Me personally, I'm perfectly comfortable saying uh, Republican. I have no problems with it. And so that in New York, like, you know, oh, I, I, exactly. In, I was surprised that it went as well as it did in Palm Beach. So I will say that in defense of the audiences down here. Um, you gotta, you gotta respect that joke. I feel like you have to respect a clever joke, even if, even if it's offensive against you, like a and, lot and, of people don't. Yeah. Oh, most people don't obviously, yeah. but comedians live by that rule. Like I could make a joke specifically about Dave Siegel. Like when you showed up here, you were like, <laughs> how is, how do I sound? How do I look? I was like, everything's great. But your, your face, there's so, like, I admit, I went after your face. <laughs> But it was like in an effort to be funny and and test audio. Like I don't yeah, really you know, think I don't really you think have senses of humor about themselves. Right. Like, fine, I, I could work with you. I could. Our, we can go out for dinner with our wives, and I'll make. But I'm. It, it, we're never going to get past a point of like where we can be really good friends yeah. if I can't make uncomfortable jokes in front of you and I can't make fun of you. So given all that, um, is there any other examples, by the way, or just uh, w- what is the answer to the question? Like just getting out and performing. Do, do you have a concern or do you, am I supposed to just do the most anodyne material about, you know, I've got to, I'm working on a bit right now about, you know, helicopter parents and how I'm trying to. I've always been doing these kind of bits, but as raising my girls, everybody's afraid to let their kids do anything. And I guess that's controversial to some. It certainly is. But like, I don't want really. Can we? We're just having fun. It's just comedy. But it is my don't opinion. You think, don't you think that like, if you're watching like a master stand-up comedian, we all have different ideas of who those people are. The funny is always going to be the first check mark. Like, is this funny? Yeah. Yes. And if you have that, I I truly believe it doesn't matter 
what you're saying politically or, or sociologically. Yeah, but I'm not. But I, I agree with that fully. But I'm not that type of comedian who can do Jim Gaffigan or Jerry Seinfeld observational non you know, divisive about a Q-tip. Those guys are amazing. I, I, I have tremendous respect for anybody who can do that. I take things from my life, opinions that I have, and then I, you know, make them absurd or, or, or rage about them or whatever, you know, so. Let me, let me ask you a question. Yeah. Do you remember the first stand-up bit that you heard about 9-11? <laughs> um, I remember a conversation two comedians had about whether or not they can do bits about 9-11, but I don't remember a, a, a specific bit. Uh, oh, I do remember a bit, though, Joan Rivers um, with the most... And do you remember about how long it was after 9-11? Uh, maybe five years. Oh, God. All right, so do you remember eating it on the Lower East Side? Yeah, yeah, I did that. Ooh. Yeah, same here. I saw Louis C.K. at eating it, you know, for people that are unfamiliar, this is a venue that probably fit 60 people at most. I don't know. But it was like very well respected uh, in New York City. And uh, CK was up there. And I think this was still 2001. I don't know when, but maybe December, I want to say. And he had a joke where it was along the lines of it's a good way to measure how good of a human being you are by asking yourself, how long after the events of 9-11 did you wait to masturbate again? <laughs> and then he, that got a huge laugh. And then he followed it up with, for me, it was between the collapses of Towers 1 and 2. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah like, I mean, first of all, he, he, yes, he used 9-11 as like a crutch for the joke. The joke yeah. was about him. Like he was the butt it was like such a tension breaker and the joke was so funny that the subject matter like almost got lost in like the most sensitive, like hyper, uh, yeah, it's such a, I, the way I'm unpacking that joke, it's, it's, can I, am I allowed to have any kind of pleasure during a time of horrible tragedy? So if, if I'm at a funeral for my grandmother, like right. how soon, like, can we go out? Can we go to an amusement park that night? Can right. you know? And I mean, it's like pleasuring yourself in this case. It seems you, like you shouldn't be doing anything but grieving, mourning, or being shocked. And, and anything that you're doing, anything else you're doing seems almost selfish. So before you even get to jerking off, I that's such an interesting bit to unpack as is so much of his stuff, obviously. But the point, the whole thing is like, I think if, like so many comedians could have attempted a joke about 9-11 two months after the fact and failed miserably. Well, but the, the level of comedy was so for, high that it replaced the sensitivity and the, and the offensiveness potential, in my opinion. I think that is a, a truth even now, but it's still it's it. It's still going to be hard. It's, it, it's that's different, though. OK, I don't think it's the truth because you're now talking if I make fun of. Republicans or conservatives or Trump or Nick DiPaolo makes fun of liberals, Democrats or Biden, whatever it is, people take it. You're talking about me and my core beliefs. I'm not talking about the other things that are sacred cows, cancer, Holocaust, you know, or or 9-11. We're, you're talking about my core, my current core beliefs and you're making fun of them. Yeah, look, and I think I, I have no problem with people making fun of my core beliefs. And I also think from a psychology standpoint, if you take offense to someone that's making a joke about your core beliefs, you have a little insecurity about your core beliefs. Like I'm I'm strong enough in my convictions where I, I'm comfortable with what I feel about certain issues that someone making fun of them isn't going to affect me because like, I, I'm like, pretty confident. I, I think that's that's a great way. To be, but I think that, and I probably share that for the most part. But most people aren't like that. And I what are your you. and what are your feelings about people who don't like taking walks at dusk on the beach? <laughs> like someone who would make fun of you for that, even. <laughs> it's fine because a uh, it's not a walk on the beach. First of all, it's a a bike to the beach. Do you use dusk? In other situations, like, did your wife like, where are you going? It's almost dusk. Yeah, we try to put it in. We try to use it three or four times a day. What about <laughs> <laughs> what time do you want to eat? How's dusk? Yeah, but if, if it's getting like late and it's already like past dusk where it gets hard, it gets hard. You have to almost like use it like, 
hey, can you get the broom? There's a little dusk on the floor. So right. like, you just dust? keep, you've no, no dust, but I got the dusk in, you know? <laughs> uh, so did, I watched about, we should have given each other an assignment to watch Dave Chappelle's special and then examine it. Um, yeah. But instead, let's just uh, examine it as two straight white men. At least you're mm-hmm. Jewish, so you have some credibility. Yeah. Um, and I have trans friends. <laughs> <laughs> you're so open minded. So you mean no, the, the barista at Starbucks? Well, I don't know. Like for me, like Chappelle, before we even get to the content, his delivery and performance has always been the thing for me. His his diction. His energy, his even his movement, the way he drops that mic and hits himself in the thigh, even if it's not my favorite joke. Like I love I've all it's always been appealing, his kind of laid back, almost high delivery, which a lot of which, by the way, is based on uh, Tony Woods. And he admitted that not too long ago, Tony Woods, who came up ahead of him in D.C., where you also started. And so, you know, about all that. But but anyway. But to the I don't even I don't haven't even read what the controversies are other than uh, talking about he he identifies with a certain ideology that there are just two genders. And apparently J.K. Rowling's believes in this and she's been harangued and the trans community really is uh, offended by Dave Chappelle, including we found out that the showrunner of Dear White People apparently is a white person who is now boycotting Netflix because of Dave Chappelle's new special. So I don't know that much. I probably shouldn't be talking about it and recording it, but, I, but I, but I am anyway. And you're, you know, what are your, what are your thoughts? If, if any on it, I tried to set it up as well as I could. Yeah. A few things about Chappelle. First of all, th- I think in my opinion, th- there's very few comedians that are necessary and he's one of them. I'm not hmm. talking about funny. I'm not talking about popular comedians that are necessary. And I feel like he's on maybe a list of five. Hmm. So that's right off the bat. Secondly, in regards to what you were saying about like just his delivery and smoking cigarettes on the stage and slapping his mic, yeah. when you change the game, like it's almost like an athlete when they change the rule of a sport to accommodate for a certain athlete because they're that good at it, that needs to be recognized. Like when you see comedians in New York starting to like, oh, he's imitating Dave Chappelle, like that's a big deal. Like yeah. you used to see it with Dave Attell a lot in New York. Like yeah. he's doing Attell. When Dane Cook was at his prime, like there were these, you know, comedians started holding the mic like this, you know, by the, by the belt. And that was a Dane Cook thing. And so you'll see a lot of uh, comedians imitating Dave Chappelle. So his credibility is, uh, you know, there's no doubt about that. Yeah. So now let's get to the trans joke. Like this was the joke and I'm paraphrasing. It was something along the lines of every human being here came out of a woman's vagina and there's no denying that. Okay. There's two genders and every woman here, every person here came out from between a woman's legs. And some, then something to the point of like, you could, you know, make a vagina, but it's never going to be the same. And that's the, like, that's where like people are up in arms about. And I think that just reverts back to what we were saying. Like, first of all, why is it so prohibited to, to make a, observation about the trans community but like jews are like carte blanche like have at them like we don't we're not offended by that like there are comedians that still perform in countries where jews are not allowed to be but nobody cares about that like jews are not allowed to be citizens in certain countries where comedians go american comedians go and perform yeah i support i support a lot of those countries in many ways i i I know a pete and you know i'll always try to convert you but with mo- mainly, I only order things from those countries. There's a list. You can get it on my website. I mean, how much hummus do you possibly need? <laughs> <laughs> That's the only thing they're exporting. But, um, you know, and then, but then there's groups where you just can't, they can't be the focus of your joke or your observation. And this goes to what we we're talking about, about people being offended because it's their personal group that is the basis of the bit. And even worse are the people that got get vicariously offended where it's like, I'm not trans, but I think it's the appropriate thing to be offended at this. I feel like what he's doing in this special and and we can get outside of Dave Chappelle and, and, and just talk in general that that people have kind of a competition of who's been discriminated against, oppressed, marginalized the most. And I actually think there's a place for that conversation 
I do. I think that's a fine conversation to have because well, why? Why make it a competition? It, well, I wouldn't make it a competition, but I would I would try to create. I would try to have a conversation about the facts of living in, say, America today and what it means that you are or not marginalized, discriminated against how you are and how that happens so that we can understand it, be empathetic towards it. And then if if possible, create policies to create more equity. And I think that uh, so I think that that matters like you, you and I think that black people overwhelmingly probably still have it the worst because you know they're black you can see them it's it's not like anything else and because of the history of this country yet jewish people were exterminated but you don't you can't discriminate against them as easily in line at the grocery store uh except for when you can and and some people would say that that's actually an argument why they should be protected more because The whole thing about Jews is like they're trying to sneak in and take over. You know, why aren't you wearing a yarmulke? Right. We should be able to identify you as a Jew. And then all of a sudden, the CEO of your company doesn't have a Jewish last name, but he's in charge. And then you find out, wait, that guy's Jewish. People start to resent that. So I'm not I'm not necessarily like disagreeing with you. Those are are truths, but they don't discount the, the point of neither of those happen when you get on an elevator when you apply for a job, when, Correct. you know, so but, even but, before but, that, if, if, if someone has a quote unquote black name and their resume just gets tossed. Exactly. There's a ton of data right. on that. But that's Absolutely. but I'm saying the conversation you and I are having about it right now is a worthy, educational, informative conversation. I prefer it to be had by two academics who've studied the issue or historians or psychologists. But it's but it, but comedians can talk about it. People can talk about it and. And concede points and understand it. And I think that is what's happening with uh, the trans movement um, is that, fr- frankly, what I my understanding is that there's a lot of disagreement within the trans movement about several different issues. And so the rest of us, you know, I think we should kind of mostly take a hands off approach and be like, OK, I'm just trying to understand what you want and how I can accommodate it and understand it, because I I just generally look at such things and say, listen, it doesn't affect me directly. So let me understand how it affects you. Uh, And 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 and, you know, and by the way, you don't in in such issue, you don't know when it might. Maybe it will. Maybe one of my kids will uh, at at some point identify differently than they do now. And then it certainly will affect me more directly. But I feel like there's kind of a a a bystander approach that many of us have yeah, in this case with you and I, like I'm, I'm going to ask your opinion on thi- all things related to Judaism. And uh, I know enough to maybe launch a disagreement or something, but like I'm not like I want to know what you think. You're Jewish. Your name is Siegel. You look like that. I don't know what well, that had to do. Here, anything. Me, here, just yeah, your profile could be any ethnicity. It's not it's not. Yeah. All no, right. I don't think your nose is would out of any. Your face looks <laughs> totally symmetrical and in proportion. Wait, did you say symmetrical or semitic? <laughs> I said I said symmetrical, but I wish I had said semitic. <laughs> Your face is totally symmetric. Well, then, symmetrical. I'm, symmetrical. then I am semitic too, because my dad is half Lebanese. All right. Yeah. I knew there was something there. And also, we, we, we should also say that people shouldn't get offended when you ask these questions, because that's what it's all about. And I think they do. Uh, Mark Normand has this awesome joke um, where he's like, you know, I went up to this black guy at a party and I was like, hey, you, you never see like black people skiing. It's never part of the culture. Like, why is that? Right. And the, the guy explained to him, like, you know, like we traditionally come from urban environments. It's not pushed there, like blah, blah, blah. And he gave him an answer. Mark goes, retreats back and this other guy comes up to his part at the party at the white guy. And he's like, hey, what you just did was ignorant. And Mark's like, yeah, that's why I asked. You know, exactly. I was ignorant as to why the reason was. So I asked and now I'm not ignorant anymore. And that's I, how we grow. But, but I, I mostly agree with that. And I think it's a hilarious joke. Uh, and I uh, respond. But but it, it's also a fair response for a woman. Let's take it out of race. Why do women blank for a woman to, to respond to a non woman with it's not my responsibility to explain that to you. Like, I'm not telling you how it works. Like, I, what do you think of that response? 
No, I would disagree. Okay. If someone is openly saying, I do not know something and I'd like to know it and you help me. Well, I don't speak for all women. Well, okay. So tell me your opinion. That's all. I'm only asking. There's no group. You just said there's some differences of opinion in the trans community. Of course there are. They're human beings, right? You didn't let me finish. The question that I'm asking is why won't any women have sex with me? <laughs> well, I think just, do you have a mirror there? That's the answer the woman should give. Have you seen you? Yeah. Hold on. Let me just flip my phone around. <laughs> I know we don't have a mirror here, but um, yeah. have you ever seen your face and, and self? I, I, I just feel like you can't get mad at someone for wanting to know, for wanting to. I know. I mean, you know, it's funny because when I went to college, I hung out with a bunch of black guys and longtime listeners have heard me say this forever. But the point was there was a comfort level where I could ask anything about black culture right. and, and and there was no and there was never any rules and the funny thing would be that my one of my funniest friends would would often not answer and just ask me a question about white people i i remember i said something like why do black guys you know always wear like leather jackets or pants or warm clothes in the summer in the hot heat <laughs> of summer and he was like why do white people wear birkenstocks in the winter i was like i don't know i don't i don't wear i don't know <laughs> why? why do black people wear, why do white people wear shorts and wear, i don't know I'm not that white person. I dress warmly in the winter. Okay, so I uh, I was opening for Godfrey. Uh, it was upstate New York. I forgot where. But um, I had always, I never got the cultural appropriation argument. That was one where I was like on the right wing white side. Where I'm like, let the white kid wear dreadlocks. Who gives a shit? You know, I don't care. Like, it's not racist. He likes the way it looks. Let him wear dreadlocks. It's not cultural appropriation. That was always the stance I had on that. And we had this conversation and I asked him, like, why does that upset black people? Like, who cares if Jeremy Lin wears dreadlocks or something? <laughs> why did you have to name the Asian guy? I mean, right. So, well, because that was the story that was going on at the time. That's oh, why. was he wearing? He was actually. Oh, that is true. He actually an Asian guy, a Chinese American right. guy was Okay. It actually happened. Sorry. I thought that was right. hypothetical. You got that, was the, that was the story that prompted yeah. it. So I'm yeah. like, I was from the who gives a shit if white kids wear their shorts around their you know ankles because they're imitating black kids. Like, why does that bother black people? Like, I never got it. And he broke it down for me. And I did a 180 and I changed my mind. And he was basically what he said was, it's not about the dreadlocks per se. It's not about the shorts. It's not like black people take ownership of dreadlocks. It's that why are you so cool with our, our culture in a dreadlocks, music, clothing way, but when we want to buy a house in your neighborhood, all of a sudden it's not that cool. We don't love your culture so much. You, pro you should have said because you don't take care of your lawn. <laughs> So, but he, he changed my mind. I'm like, okay, I get that. It's more of like a resentment from like, right. no, if you want to love me, love me in an entirety. I like that. I, I, I like that answer a lot. And, but I'm still a bit ignorant myself on cultural appropriation and it depends. It's a case by case basis, but I think a lot of like borrowing from other cultures and making it part of your life is a wonderful, beautiful thing, uh, especially when it comes to surface, yeah. food. I mean, and if you art. remember, I forget who the player was who criticized Jeremy Lin. He played for the Nets. I want to say Kenyon Martin, but I'm not sure. A black NBA player was giving him shit for wearing dreadlocks, and it turned out that that player had a Chinese character tattoo oh, wow. on his arm, and Jeremy Lin called him out for it. That's smart. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm 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 interested to hear what folks listening to this conversation think about all of that and everything else that we discussed and would love to continue discussing any of those things with anybody and with people who know uh and you know have stronger informed opinions than than I do on on such things certainly than Dave does. <laughs> what do I know? I don't know. But it's always interest I think comedians think about a lot of things a lot like I started going to therapy when I was 24 because I not for any reason no one said you should go to therapy or you have this re issue or, or that I think everybody can benefit from therapy no matter who you are found out I did have some stuff but I went <laughs> for the material I was like I need more material so if I have this discussion about me and a kind of an autobiographical personal 
type material comedian. And I think that's true of all things in life about comedians. You're just constantly pushing it and questioning something about a trend, uh, a cultural thing, a- anything. You're you're just constantly thinking. That's what comics do. And then so I generally I think that co- conversations between comedians like ours and a lot of other shows are, are usually go. pretty good. Awesome. Um, have you been with the same therapist for like 20 years? No, no. I went to one woman in my 20s. And it, I actually think it's interesting to talk about, you know, the different. But I went to one woman in my 20s. She was great. I went to another woman, you know, in, in the second phase, my next phase of my life. So, like, I went to one you, woman. You, when I was, like, how did you, like, start over with someone? Like, that it's hard. Be, like, it's hard. And it's what's holding me back right now. Because I don't have, I don't want to like tell someone everything. I, I don't mind right. it at all, but I'm like, it's going to take three sessions right. for you just to get my story. Can I just send you an essay and then we can start? I have <laughs> anger issues. Can we just, <laughs> I'm angry. That have I have to... anger issues? Yes. I have anger okay. issues. Do you like lose your temper easily? Is that what it is? Yes. Yeah. Interesting. Who would have known? Anybody that knows anybody that has been around me for a little while. Do you find yourself <laughs> yelling even though you know you shouldn't yell? Yes. Ah, oh, man. Get, yes. Keep going. Okay. Ask me more. Because it already feels like therapy. Do you not what? have these issues? You don't. No, you, I do. My big thing is huh? for 23 and a half hours a day, I'll say if I have a disagreement with my wife, keep your cool, stay calm. Don't yell. Don't raise your voice. Like the volume doesn't do anything. Like it doesn't inflate your point or make you more right. And then we'll get into disagreement and I'll find myself yelling. <laughs> yeah. <I'm laughs> the exact same way. I have a, have an even, you know, I have that kind of in my head conversation, but I also have a, I like mantras in such situations. Mantras have helped me with my emotional issues to just calm down, whether it's take a beat, you know, uh, take a breath uh, or in this case with your spouse or your kids, even as you'll see, when your kids gain agency right now, they they can't chew solid food if I if I have it right. But the is would you rather be happy or right? It's a it's a it's a huge. I mean, ego comes into it. I yes. do bits about this. Ego comes into it huge. in such a way that it will just destroy anything. Like there's no reason why ego should play a role, but it does. And I think it's naive to say like you don't want to be right, but that's a you know that's a constant battle in. Oh, it's a, and, it, for me, it's a constant battle in everything. Last night I was hanging out with subscribers. People actually pay for the show and we were having a discussion and then a, um, a kind argument about the issue of that I mentioned earlier about helicopter parents. And I want to send my daughter. I have no problem sending my daughter and her friends into New York City and other people there were disagreeing. And at one point I jokingly, mostly jokingly, was like, this is a fine discussion, but I'm right. <laughs> And the woman who was disagreeing with me had a great, like, funny joke. She's like, yeah, you have the pink light, like, in my studio with my pink light on. Like, it was like, it means nothing. Uh, and neither does, you know, but I felt so strongly about my opinion. I felt like I'm right. And that's true of, of my, com- my arguments with my wife or my daughters when I lose my, my temper. And I, I, I lose my temper with, with other people as well in public or strangers when, you know, like, and I don't know, it's you hear the phrase lose my temper or and it means different things to different people. But I, I certainly get agitated easily with with like my daughter's principal who wouldn't let me drop her lunch off inside the school. I had to leave it outside on a bench. I was like, it's food, dude. Yeah, the pro- the difference is with your wife, like with your spouse, I should say, you know, it's different from arguing with someone in a bar because at the end of the day with the person in the bar, you're going to leave and go home. Right. Completely. With your, with your spouse, a dis- a, a, a decision has to be made as to whether we're going to let our daughter go into the city. And if you're not on the same page, like somebody has got to compromise yeah. some, so you have to come to some sort of agreement and that's pretty hard. Yeah. We, yeah. Luckily my wife and I mostly agree on the big, same important here. like decisions. when it comes to our kids, thank yeah. God, my wife and I are 99% of the time on the same page. It's more like our shit happens when it's like between us. You know? Yeah, for yeah, for yeah. sure. I mean, I also have a record of in my marriage of of arguing the big things, and then as time plays out, realizing that my argument was wrong. And well, but you know what? It goes. I would say it goes a really long way when you say, "Hey, honey, I was wrong about that, and I just want you to know, I'm sorry." Yeah, but the, and I'm I will I pride myself on that, and that's what I feel. Not you know, I feel while well, I have this issue, but I'm really good at at. Uh, 
begging forgiveness and pointing out where I went wrong and why I went wrong and then doing the same thing again. So it's like it, it runs out even that quality where you're able to because uh, I am I'm good at, at apologizing and, and, and being very contrite, specifically contrite. But then if you do it again, it's like even your thoughtful apology runs out of steam when you when you continue with a repetitive sure. behavior. And I think that's true yeah. of all people. I think that's yeah. true of, of, of everybody. You know, you got to You got to change something about that. But yeah. So anyway, the therapy uh, and I think it's great. And now then I went to a, 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 a when I lost my job, I started again and like I was dealing with anxiety and depression over all that and ego related stuff. I went to two guys. The first guy was not great. The second guy was was pretty good. And now I really want to work more on the emotional stuff. And I just am not sure where to go and who to talk to. And it's, it's, I have no problem with therapy. I do think finding the right therapist is, is, can be tough. But, you know, with all these apps now and these services now, you can find, you know, you can really maybe find the type of person you're looking for that specializes in the type of issues that you have. So for you, it would be like struggling with uh, your appearance, I bet. (laughs) It's, there's always alcohol also. You know, the guy that sells, the guy that works at my liquor store is, is great. What is your alcohol? Now that I'm in South Florida, I've been drinking rum, which is so weird. Like oh. Nobody drinks rum, but like it's such it's a thing here. How do you drink it? I'll put like fresh juices in it. And when will you drink it? When do you allow I, I'm yourself? I'm a drinker. I, I drink. I'll have like a, a, on the weekend. Like we have a pool. Like we'll sit around the pool. Right. We'll so only. Yeah. So you don't have a drink during the week? No. Oh, look I'm not you. a big drinker. Not in not in the comedy clubs either. Like I was in, I was at the Improv in Palm Beach a couple of weeks ago. Mm. You know, the host is fucking like boozing. <laughs> like he's like he's there because of the free booze, basically. Like it was funny because uh, I'm I'm I was with Mark Norman. I'm watching like every minute of his set because I just love it. Like yeah. he's so funny. I love seeing the audience react to him. The host is just in the green room the whole time, and I'm thinking like. Don't you want to see this guy? Like, don't you want to see, like, watch? It's like a lot of, a lot of guys is just about, you know, the culture being out yeah, and, and, and not even caring about anybody else, just caring about their own shit. But yeah, yeah. I, I'm with you. I, I love to sit and watch the guys I that I love to watch. How is let me I'll let you go. But I just do want to ask, like, how is it going with the kids? I mean, how old are they now? And how's dadding? Like me, you got two well, girls. My, my two year old will uh, unfortunately never remember her New York days. My seven-year-old, yeah, she totally remembers it and misses the seasons. And how come it never gets cold here? But she's also thriving. Like, she goes to an amazing school um, that we love and we're, like, t- taking part in and, you know, really getting active. You got to pay for it? Is it a... We do have to pay for it. Yeah. Uh, but that was a decision we came to. And, the you know, the amount of money we're saving by not being in Manhattan, like, it wasn't that is much. Your, of is your cost of living so much less and so much better like you have so more- it is, I will say that it's not as big a difference as we thought because all of a sudden you have to get two cars, right? Um, but you, you're not paying income tax, which is huge. The property taxes are much lower, but like it's not as big as like people when you. I mean, Manhattan's crazy. You know, yeah, like, Manhattan is not a great place to compare anything to because yeah, right. So like uh, leaving Manhattan, like it, it, what it is a nice little cost of living difference. Well, I am uh, really excited to hear about all the changes in your life, and uh, I hope everybody will see you along with Christian Finnegan and Kurt Metzger. uh, Yeah, we're starting a venue here. Awesome. Very exciting, buddy. And uh, excited for everything with you, man. I appreciate you joining me today. It's a great discussion. Thanks, bro. I appreciate you having me. There you go, Dave Siegel, everybody, at Stand Up Dave. Tell him you heard him here on the show and you appreciate him. Go to Comedy on the Green, Boca Raton, to see him, uh, along with uh, Christian Finnegan in November, Kurt Metzger in October. Check it out right now. Follow him on all the socials as well, all those links with everything else in the show notes. Thanks again to Waj, and thank you to putting up with my schedule. And I always hate taking a break from the normal format of the show, but when I'm so busy like this running around the country, Hard to do the news, and I'll get back to it, but I appreciate your support. As always, StandUpWithPete.com. StandUpWithPete.com, and that's all I've got for you today. Tomorrow, I've got Tim Wise. I've also got this amazing transgender woman joining me, Jesse Earl, Jesse Gender, coming up. Christian Finnegan scheduled to join me as well, and so much more this week alone. So much more? Well, we'll see. 
Thank you guys very much. And now it's time for Grammy Award winning singer songwriter, stand up subscriber, the great John Carroll, taking us out as he does every day. They had to stand up. They had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws. And since they weren't even sent, they knew that change was going to come before the change could begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. See him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up stand All right, up. we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be toes up, you got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no wanton try Rise up, show up to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide it says stand up stand oh, up got to stand up oh, come on just 